I guarantee you that at some point, everything's gonna go south on you. Ready? And you're gonna say, this is it. What the hell? This is how I end. Commander, Mark is dead. We have to go, man. Now you can either accept that, or you can get to work. This will come as quite a shock to my crewmates, and to NASA, and to the entire world. But I'm still alive. Surprise. Here's the rub. It's gonna be four years for another mission to reach me. And I'm gonna have designed to last 31 days. So I gotta make water and grow food on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, then none of this matters anyway. We've got an incoming message. My God. <laughs> Mark Watney is still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. There must be some kind of way out of here. Okay, so let's do the math. I have enough food to last for 50 days. He's going to starve to death long before we can help. So, I'm gonna have to science the out of this. He's 50 million miles away from home. He's totally alone. What the hell is he thinking right now? I am the greatest botanist on this planet. I know how to save Mark Watney. But we need the Hermes crew. We either have a high chance of killing one or a low chance of killing six. I'm not risking their lives. It's bigger than one person. No. It's not. NASA rejected the mission. So if we do this? We're talking mutiny. If anything goes wrong, we die. Do you realize how crazy this is? We have no other option. No matter what happens, tell the world, tell my family, that I never stop fighting to make it home. Pretty cool stuff, huh? I'm Bob Cabana. I'm the director here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and I have the privilege of leading this amazing team that is helping take us on a journey to Mars, a real journey to Mars, and it's going to be awesome. Well, I got a few folks I want to introduce in the audience uh, before we get started, and I expect to hear some loud applause as uh, certain folks are introduced, and I think you'll figure it out. From Cocoa, Florida, we have the Bionic Tigers. And, and these are first robotic teams that are in the area. From Cocoa Beach and Rockledge, Team Pink. Well, I hope they're here. I, hear, I see some empty seats. From Astronaut and Titusville High School in Titusville, Combat. All right. And we got a CubeSat team from Merritt Island building Stangsat. All right. In addition to that, we've got over 10,000 students from across the United States on NASA's largest distance learning network event we've ever done. All right, so NASA's on a journey to Mars. Already, from these shores out here, robotic precursors have launched to the red planet, and they're roaming it right now, learning and exploring. But right here at the Kennedy Space Center, from launch pad 39B, right out here, we are preparing to launch humans to Mars. Over in the Vehicle Assembly Building, right behind us, High Bay 3 has been totally gutted of all the shuttle infrastructure, and we're putting in the new platforms to support a rocket that's going to be more capable than the Saturn V, NASA's space launch system. And on top of that is going to be the Orion vehicle, the Orion crew vehicle, multi-purpose crew vehicle that's being built 
right here at KSC in the operations and checkout building. That is all happening right now. We are preparing to send humans beyond our home planet once again, and it is absolutely awesome. All right. In addition to that, we're enabling commercial operations to low Earth orbit. We're building the capability to get crews to the International Space Station on a U.S. rocket. There are just all kinds of great things going on. Well, I had the privilege of flying on the space shuttle four times, and let me tell you, that is one heck of a ride. And what I wouldn't give to do it again, what I really wouldn't give is to be able to ride that space launch system on a journey beyond our home planet. But, you know, that's going to be up to you guys, okay? And I'm looking forward to seeing who ends up on that first trip to Mars because it's going to be something special. Now, I often get asked, how do you become an astronaut? Well, obviously, you've got to meet all the technical qualifications, right? Well, I think the, one of the primary goals is persistence. It's not giving up and finding your passion. I challenge all of you, find your passion because a couple things happen. First off, if you're passionate about it, you're going to do really well at it. And we look for folks that excel in their field. Not only that, it's going to make it fun, all right? And work isn't work, it's fun. And that's what's cool about being here at KSC. I don't care what you're doing at Kennedy Space Center. Folks are passionate about it. They enjoy their work. I just love coming to work every day, being part of this team that is making science fiction science fact. It is awesome. Um, I wanted to be a pilot. Flying was my passion. And I got down to Pensacola, and I didn't pass my eye test. Oh, man, was I disappointed. And I became a naval flight officer for three years. And I finally, you know, convinced them I could see. They caught me on a technicality, but I passed all my eye tests after that. I got back down to Pensacola, and I became a, a naval aviator. Uh, I was a Marine pilot, but a naval aviator got to fly. And then I said, man, I'd like to use all that math and engineering I had in college at the Naval Academy along with my flying abilities and be a test pilot. So I applied for Navy test pilot school. They said, ah, sorry, Bob, we don't need any A6 pilots. Six months later, I got picked up for test pilot school. Well, then NASA's taken applications for the shuttle program, and I applied for the third group of shuttle astronauts. I actually qualified, and I went through the whole process, and I just couldn't wait for that call that said, come on down. And the call came, and they said, sorry, Bob, you didn't make it. Oh, man, was I crushed. But they said, we're going to take some more next year. We'd like you to try again. So I went through that whole process again, reapplied, and was fortunate enough to get selected uh, the next year. So I didn't get into pilot training on the first try, didn't get into test pilot school on the first try, and I didn't get into the astronaut program on the first try. Persistence, okay? Set a goal for yourself and don't give up and follow your passion. And I'm telling you, dreams can come true. They sure did for me, and they can do it for you too. All right. So right now, I'd like to introduce NASA's real Martian, the head of planetary science at NASA headquarters, Dr. Jim Green. Jim? Thank you very much, Bob. Indeed, before you uh, really uh, watch the movie and, and get absorbed in that, I need to give you a little background about Mars. You know, so if we'd have my first slide, what we'd like to do, of course, is to learn to be a Martian. And I don't see my slides yet. <laughs> so uh, let me mention a few things while they're getting them up. And that is indeed, uh, Bob is right. It really takes persistence. I have my own story in that. And so please really listen to that and take, it, take his advice. Well, let's talk about Mars and its past. Mars looked much more like Earth three billion years ago. We know that now. We have a rover down on the ground that's made measurements. Uh, of ancient river and stream beds, and in fact, the northern hemisphere of Mars, two-thirds of its northern hemisphere was underwater. This actually is a pretty, a pretty good representation of what Mars probably looked like three billion years ago. It's at that time, three billion years ago, that life started here on Earth. And so perhaps life started on Mars. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is follow the water. Where is the water? Where did it go? Next slide, please. And indeed, to be able to do that kind of work, we needed a rover. And our rovers have landed, and we've uh, toured through several areas that we're going to talk about. But first, here is a, um, a view of, um, uh, from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of evidence of flowing water. And uh, uh, what happens, next slide please, hopefully, uh, hopefully this is an animated slide. No, 
Okay, that didn't work either. <laughs> Next slide, please. We're going to keep going. What we found on Mars is craters that literally weep. And we now know that's made of water. That, that is briny water, actually. And because the temperatures are so low on Mars, that water has been able to stay in that form before it evaporates away. Now, here's an overview of Mars. Uh, here's where we've actually put things down on the ground. The Vikings Pathfinder, which Pathfinder actually plays a prominent role in the movie The Martian. Phoenix, we, uh, we landed several years ago. And Spirit and Opportunity, you can see where they are. But the two rovers that are working today are Opportunity and Curiosity. And in fact, the next one that we're going to launch right out here, oh, actually it's in, uh, it's in Vandenberg, I forgot. So we're gonna go to Vandenberg next time uh, and launch uh, the InSight mission in March. And this is where it's going to land, just above uh, Curiosity. So next slide, please. So here's Curiosity. This actually is a selfie. It's made up of 54 individual pictures that they sent back, and indeed we, we knitted it together to show you what it looks like on, on the beautiful Mars uh, uh, planet uh, at a place called Gale Crater. Next slide, please. So what did Curiosity find? Curiosity has a drill. It's gone down below that red soil, the, the, what we call uh, perchlorates that, that we, we talk about a lot that's on the soil. And when you see these holes and the amount of material that's come up, it's gray Mars. It's a completely different type of, of soils. It's got carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And it's far more moist than we ever imagined. And so a lot of the water that was on Mars actually has gone underground. Next slide, please. So here's our current array of satellites. We have our orbiters, also our two rovers that are working. As I mentioned, the next one we're going to launch is InSight in 2016. And then ESA is going to launch a mission called Trace Gas Orbiter. And that will arrive uh, also on the Red Planet late in 2016, about the March, April, or sorry, September, October time frame. In the future, ESA is developing a rover called ExoMars, and we're building right now the Mars 2020 rover. And this will launch in 2020, and of course it takes about nine months to get there. And it has an array of wonderful instruments, as uh, briefly shown on the next slide. So here's all the instruments. It sort of looks like Curiosity, but it actually it has a whole new set of instruments. And there's one from uh, Norway. This is a ground-penetrating radar. We're going to be looking for aquifers. We're going to be looking for where perhaps water is stored underneath the surface of the planet. Uh, next slide, please. One of the really neat experiments is called MOXIE. And this instrument, this Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, so it's an acronym within an acronym. We, you know, we love doing that. That's called MOXIE. This brings in the CO2 atmosphere, and through a process we call electrolysis, pops off an oxygen, vents the carbon monoxide, and then stores the oxygen. It does it in the morning, it does it at noon, it does it in the afternoon, it does it at night. It does it through the whole day and throughout, off and on through the whole year. This provides us a baseline for us to be able to understand when the most efficient times are to be able to extract oxygen out of the very thin air of Mars that we can use for a whole variety of things. Fabulous instrument. Next slide, please. We're also developing a variety of technologies that we're going to plan on using next. One, of course, is the deep space optical communication. We use radio waves to communicate back and forth with our satellites. And the way we can get more data is to change the wavelength instead of a very long wave, uh, a radio wave, we're going to use the very short wavelengths of light. And we can transfer far more information. So we're going to have optical communication from Mars to Earth. We'll need it because we'll need the video, we'll need the audio, and we'll need the data. And it's only that mechanism that will allow us to bring all that back in a very timely manner. We also are developing solar electric propulsion. This is where we take a gas. It's typically xenon. 
we ionize it, that means we pop off some electrons, and then we accelerate it out the back of a spacecraft, and that pushes us in the other direction. So it is like the, um, on Star Trek, it would be like, um, uh, not warp speed, but what did they call it? Impulse, impulse speed, it's just that low little trickle that we need. This is the first start of it. And these are gonna be huge ion engines that will allow us to haul tens of tons of material back and forth to Mars. We're also developing the capability to put large mass down on the ground. Right now, Curiosity is a one metric ton rover. But to support humans, we're probably gonna need an area uh, that, that will support 40 tons worth of habitats and, and other things that we'll need to put on the ground. And our thinking is we'll probably do it in sections, 10 tons each. Uh, we'd like to be able to do more, but uh, if we can go in order of magnitude better, that would be spectacular. So the uh, entry, descent, and landing capability that we're developing now is hopefully gonna give us that order of magnitude advance. And that, of course, are key technologies that really help it make uh, the humans to Mars happen. Next slide, please. So how do we get there? It takes exploration. It takes our human exploration uh, to do a variety of things. It takes our science to lead the way. And it takes technologies to help us make it happen. And uh, next slide, please. How we do that is... The exploration activities are currently going on on space, space station, low Earth orbit, pioneering a number of the things from growing food. You know, we've grown food now in, in, in space, romaine lettuce, and doing other kinds of research in that. Long-term access to space, you know, living in space for long periods of time. Uh, uh, one of the Kelly brothers is doing that now. Uh, and, of course, the next slide, please, we're developing the capability with the Space Launch System and the Orion capsule to go well beyond Earth orbit, well past Moon, and into uh, deep space. And next slide, please. And, of course, we're developing the science tools now, the continually orbiting and roving on Mars to be able to get us the information to know what Mars is really like. So it's the combination of these three activities that will make it happen. And so, next slide. The evolution of a Martian starts with our science, it starts with our uh, ground truth that we get from our rovers, and it builds up to human exploration. And so with that, I think I want to introduce the next segment, which is a video. This will tell you much more about uh, exploration on uh, going to our journey on Mars. So let's cue that up. Thank For the first time since the Apollo moon landings, NASA is preparing to send astronauts beyond Earth orbit. And this time, the mission is the most ambitious we have ever undertaken. The journey to Mars. Carrying out this journey will require bringing together the best of our efforts, from robotic probes, to technology development, to astronauts in orbit, to robust new space vehicles. The journey is already underway, right here, right now. Astronauts aboard the International Space Station are learning more about living and working in space for long periods of time. Vital information for the challenging trip to Mars. Transportation to and from this station will be provided by our American commercial cargo and crew partners. Next, using the Orion crew vehicle and the powerful Space Launch System rocket, NASA will move into the proving ground of space, around and beyond the moon. Here, we will carry out increasingly ambitious missions to test out new systems and capabilities needed to reach Mars like deep space habitats and advanced propulsion systems. Even as we speak, our robotic scouts are already exploring the Red Planet, preparing the way for astronauts to join them. Once we have matured our capabilities in the proving ground, we'll be ready for Earth independence, reaching our planetary neighbor, not just as temporary visitors, but as pioneers, 
expanding human presence into our solar system. All right, thank you. You have heard from two of our excellent panelists this morning, Jim Gray and Bob Cabana. So let's introduce the other three, and then we will get to some questions. My name is Sarah Ramsey, and uh, I'd like to let our other panelists tell you a little bit about themselves. So with us, we have Mackenzie Davis, Annie Caraccio, and Ray Wheeler. So Mackenzie, let's start with you if we can. Um, your character, Mindy Park, who I just finished the book and I thought was one of my favorite characters. Do you see her... Um, as inspiring young women to come work for NASA? Yeah, I think that's always, hopefully, the goal with representation. I've had the, the luck of hanging out with um, Dr. Green and with Nicole Stott, who was an astronaut who lived on ISS, well, I almost said ISIS, um, for, um, for three months for over the past few days. And just getting to talk to them directly and, and have them explain things that I'm interested in to me in a way that doesn't feel prohibitive or exclusive has been such a treat. And I think that's what movies do as well, is they let you get to have a, a model for a person that, that you can get to know on an emotional level. And then um, the job that seems far away or that you hadn't seen represented before feels closer to you. Great, thank you. Annie, um, you're working on some projects that I feel like Mark Watney might have found really useful. Uh, so why don't you tell us some about those? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the projects that I work on is all about Mars, ISRU, and um, here we have a module called the Atmospheric Processing Unit, and that actually takes in the Mars atmosphere, and it converts out the carbon dioxide, which is 95% of the Martian atmosphere, and it uses cryocoolers to freeze it out, and then we send that off to a Sabatier reactor that creates methane and water. And so we really like methane because a lot of the ascent vehicles use liquid oxygen, liquid methane engines, and then water you can then later electrolyze and get the oxygen for liquid oxygen or oxygen for a crew and then hydrogen which can go back into our reactor and it's a very sustainable reaction so if I was um, heading to Mars I'd like to know that there was a lander there waiting for me that had fuel ready or water ready for a crew or a return vehicle. Great and uh, Ray I have a very important question for you. Are potatoes really the future of Martian cuisine? They are. <laughs> um, Becky, as you know, I'm a botanist and specifically a plant physiologist, and, and I've been working for NASA for over, well, it's getting close to 30 years now, and I've spent most of my career studying plant growth in controlled environment systems. And the intent of that is to really look at the potential for plants uh, to provide life support in future space missions. Can they be used to produce food? And through photosynthesis, can they generate oxygen and remove CO2? So, and as it turns out, I ended up studying potatoes in particular for a lot of my research uh, at the University of Wisconsin and then here at Kennedy Space Center. Potatoes are a good choice. <laughs> That's really good to know. <laughs> that is also an excellent point. All right, uh, we're gonna get some other questions. We have got an incredible audience all across the, the country. We've got almost 10,000 students watching uh, via DLN, and we've got some awesome students here in the room, and we've got social media. So if you'd like to send us a question uh, via Twitter, you can use hashtag AskNASA, and we'll get that right here. So let's start uh, with some of our schools online. Let's go to one of our questions on the DLN. That is also an excellent point. All right, uh, we're going to take other questions. We have got an incredible audience all across the, the country. We've got almost 10,000 students watching uh, via DLN, and we've got some awesome students here in the room. And we've got social media, so if you'd like to send us a question uh, via Twitter, you can use hashtag AskNASA, and we'll get that right here. So let's start uh, with some of our schools online. Let's go to one of our questions on the DLN. Point. All right. Uh, we're going to 
line back on again. So uh, we're going to go to our first question here on the front row. Well, I, I'm turning to the NASA headquarters guy for the but it, but let me, but it, but I'm gonna no I'm, I'm gonna make a comment on you know as far as funding um, you know from a human spaceflight point of view and I'll let uh, Dr. Wheeler or Green discuss um, you know science in general from a human space point point of view it, the budget is pretty flat uh, throughout the next few years right? quite a few years in fact we have laid out an architecture that is developing a capability. And one of the things that we need to go to Mars is a really big rocket, all right? So we've got a crew vehicle and a rocket now. We're putting that infrastructure in place. Uh, we've already flown a test flight on the capsule last December. It performed flawlessly. We're flying a test flight of the rocket with the capsule and no crew in, um, in 20, uh, well, late 2018, okay? And then our goal is to fly it with a crew in 2021. Um, once we have proven that capability, then the money that was going for research and development on that capability now drifts off, right? Because we're in an operational phase, so we can take that delta and apply it to developing a habitability module. You know, the Orion crew vehicle only supports a crew for 21 days, a crew of four, all right? If we want to stay in space longer than that, then we have to have a habitability module. A trip to Mars right now with current propulsion technology, and that's why we need new forms of propulsion. I mean, we're talking a year and a half to two years. It's six to eight months to get there, another six to eight months on the planet till the planet's aligned for another six to eight month trip home. So we would then develop a habit habitability module to support the crew in their travels. Well, obviously when we get there, and we're working on entry, descent, and landing, we're gonna need some sort of lander and a way to get off the planet. So it's very well staged out how we develop these capabilities as we progress given the flat budget. And I'll let Jim talk about from a science point of view. We're doing this as part of uh, our ex exploration and outreach. You know, we have in America the explorer gene. You know, we want to see what's on the other side of the hill. And it's just been delightful to be able to work in this particular area. You know, the economy has really uh, had a slump over the last several years. And once again, the administration and Congress have been really generous, as Bob says, to allow our budget to be at least flat and not decreasing. So. We really owe it all to our support in America uh, to be able to continue to do these things. What I hope you get out more than anything else today, and as Bob uh, relayed very well, we're making steady progress. We have plans and we put those plans in place. And what we're finding out at Mars with our robotic uh, missions, both the orbiters and those on the ground ro rolling around, enable us to make concrete plans on where we're gonna go, what we're gonna do, and how we're gonna use it. So all this is coming together really quite nicely. And so actually, I want to thank you for all your support. Here, here. I yeah. Think that yeah, I think that. from one of our DLN schools. My name is Sandra Salinas, and we are from Albedo, Texas, Albedo, Junior Nine. This is our question. Okay, considering Mars' atmosphere is almost a, a worse than Earth, what are the possible experiments to be done? So if I can repeat that question, um, what I understood was uh, uh, Mars' atmosphere is so thin, how are we going to be able to live and work and, and, and live on Mars? Well, indeed, the atmosphere of Mars is maybe a, a less than a percent in terms of its pressure that we have here. And so consequently, we have to have an environment uh, in a suit, and, and that's how we'll work and live. I think the movie shows uh, a design, a suit design, 
uh, that's very workable. You have to have uh, all sorts of ability to move. But you're also going to have rovers. You're also going to go to different places. Right now, our plans in terms of going to Mars is going to an area that we call an exploration zone. It's about 100 kilometers in diameter. We're going to land in one location there. We're going to live in another location there. And we're going to do science all over the place. And that's why we actually have to have larger rover vehicles uh, to make that transit from place to place to place. So we've got it covered, and we're making good progress in that area. And I got to admit, Jim, I'm watching the previews here. I'm really envious of that suit. It looks really cool. I want to try that out. Well, you know, our, our deputy administrator, Dave Anuma, has really been involved in making some of those really nice, sleek, uh, close-fitting suits that allow flexibility. And, and that's kind of some of the research that needs to be continued and, and, and perfected. And, and just to put that in perspective, when astronauts do a spacewalk on the International Space Station, you know, that suit, it's a vacuum, essentially like Mars, only more of a vacuum. You know, that suit weighs like 300 plus pounds. Okay, and it's got multiple layers to protect for micrometeorites, to provide pressure to the crew, to provide oxygen, to provide thermal protection. You know, they wear a liquid cooling garment that has water tubes flowing through it, and it's got all these special joints and stuff that they can move, but astronauts really want something that is more flexible, is more mobile, especially when you're down on the surface. And, you know, we designed the International Space Station to accommodate the suit that we had to be able to do the spacewalks, but when you're actually down on the surface moving around, you want as much mobility as you can possibly get as opposed to the suits that the Apollo astronauts wore. Great. Let's go to another question here in the room from our students here in the front. Who's got a question? Hang on, we're going to bring you a microphone. Okay, I guess that was mine too. <laughs> um, uh, that's a very interesting idea, and I, I'd like to challenge you to perfect it, and then I'll let you know how we can get it to Mars and test it out, all right? <laughs> All right, let's uh, go in the room. All right, we're going to take another question here in the room. Oh, come on. There you, I know, it's like you guys were livelier before, so. Uh, yeah, don't be shy. After working on the moon, what would be the hardest part of the trip to Mars? That I have no skill set to survive. <laughs> <laughs> Other than relating to other people and emoting for them. Um, so I don't think I'm prepared. <laughs> but I did learn a lot about um, uh, chemistry and math and the sort of person that could survive there. <laughs> so there's a model for me if I ever need to do that. Um, but no, I, I would die. <laughs> so uh, maybe we need to get Ray to uh, lead a potato boot camp? Planting potatoes? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've, uh, we've had questions coming in via social media, so let's get one of those right now. So this question is from Kelsey Hartridge, and it's for Bob Chan as an astronaut, although I think the interesting and direct map is such a resource for the station people. How plausible do you think uh, the Martian is as, as a survival story? Oh, I think it's absolutely uh, very plausible. Uh, when Andy Weir wrote the book, he initially wrote it online by chapters and uh, on a blog, and he got uh, feedback from engineers and NASA scientists. In fact, Dr. Wheeler helped with the potatoes. So, you know, I mean, everything that he talks about it is very plausible, and it could be. And, and that's, you know, when we look to pick astronauts, uh, we look for folks that, have operational skills, you know, they're obviously experts in their field, but, you know, they do hands-on kind of stuff. One of my favorite stories, Dr. Don Pettit, and when I talk about persistence, Don got selected to be an astronaut on his fifth or sixth try, all right? Um, when he was, I think he was like about 10 years old, his uh, brother went to the junkyard and bought an automatic transmission and brought it home and gave it to Don to take apart for a birthday present to learn how an automatic transmission worked, you know? And, and that's the kind of guy Don is, and he, he's a hands-on, um, you know, he's really smart, 
but he also has uh, that skill set, those tools that are needed to improvise. And, and that's what we look for, folks that can be in a challenging situation that have proven themselves in similar situations through experience uh, so that when something does happen, you know, that's out of the ordinary, they're able to they're cope with it. They're capable. So I, I thought it was an absolutely outstanding book. I couldn't put it down. Hey, Andy, would you add to some of that? Because I, I think the work that you're working on is... Yeah, so um, when I was reading the book, I was so excited because it talked about this ISRU module that got dropped down before the crew even arrived. And that's technology that NASA's working on now to develop. And that likely will hap that's what will happen. So for me to turn the pages and read about something that I could relate to at my job to get humans to Mars, just, it was awesome. I mean, it was a page turner for me. Um, another thing I really liked that he did in the book was talk about the frustrations of communication. Because if you think about the ISS right now, that's real-time communication. But when we go to Mars, that's going to be a big delay in communication. You're going to have to have an autonomous crew that can really um, do a lot on their own. And so that's why being hands-on and understanding um, how to be innovative on your own is going to be so important for that crew. And one of the fun things, it's kind of a joke that I have in my head, but um, I got to get sent away to fake Mars uh, for 120 days on the high seas mission. And we had to simulate um, living in a Martian environment and including the uh, communication delay. We had a 40-minute communication delay with everything, including mission support. And I thought that was very well captured in the book as part of a challenge that the crew is going to have to deal with because you're not going to be able to pick up the phone and say, how does this system work? Tell me now. It's you know failing right now. So uh, I, I thought he did a great job in the book with all of that. OK, let's go to one of our questions on the DLN. Well, if in transit to Mars, what will the astronaut be doing? So that's what would a, an astronaut be doing on the transit to Mars? Oh, you're looking at me. <laughs> my longest mission. Really my longest really mission. <laughs> my my longest mission was only 16 days. No, um, actually, you know, this is Scott Kelly is on the International Space Station now for a year, learning about what is required to keep a human system operating for that length of time. And uh, there have been Russians that have flown in space for over a year, but it was a long time ago. And the unique thing about having Scott up there is that Scott has an identical twin brother, Mark, who is down on Earth, also participating along with Scott. So we're going to see how uh, microgravity affects Scott for a year in space and be able to compare it to truth data on Earth. Uh, and that, that's pretty cool. But, you know, the crew on the space station, um, they have some free time also. And they read, they listen to music. Uh, you know, a number of astronauts have taken musical instruments along with them. Obviously, on a trip to Mars, storage space is going to be very, very critical. You know, you're going to have to require to take a lot of stuff with you, and every extra little thing, you know, it's going to have to serve a purpose. But, you know, there will be uh, crew health relaxation items that go along on the trip. You know, part of it's going to be just the normal maintenance of the vehicle that they're on as they go to Mars. You know, we spend a lot of time just keeping the International Space Station operating as well as doing science. And it, it's a full-time job. So the crew is going to be, uh, they're going to be actively engaged every day on that journey. Exercise is going to be extremely important. The crew on the International Space Station has mandatory exercise two hours a day. And it's aerobic exercise, strength training, uh, running on a treadmill. We found that running on the treadmill, you need that impact on the treadmill to the bones to help stem the calcium loss, uh, very similar to osteoporosis. You need the weight training. We have a resistive exercise device that feels like lifting weights. You need that strength training also to stop the calcium loss plus. You know, after uh, six to eight months in weightlessness, you don't want to get to Mars and not be able to, to operate, even though the gravity is a third of what it is on Earth. You know, you're still going to have to be mobile and move around, so you need that uh, physical fitness training. So they'll be exercising. They'll be maintaining the vehicle. Who knows? They may even have some science experiments that they take along, uh, and they'll also have some free time to uh, it just interact and, and be normal. All right. So actually, I have, a, I have a question for you. Who in the astronaut corps right now is the most likely to take disco? To take what? Disco. To go? 
I, I to, to take disco uh, as music. Disco. Oh. Uh, poor Mark Watney got stuck on Mars listening to disco. So oh, I just wanted oh, to you know who oh, who the astronaut you know, is, the, the person yeah, most likely. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I'll, I'll have to think uh, about. You, you don't actually uh, have to say we don't we don't want to embarrass them. It, it wouldn't be me. I, that that period of music can just go away as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right, let's go to another question here in the room. Who from our students has a question? Hi, I know in the movie the character has plants, some plants on Mars, and you were talking about uh, planting potatoes and growing things. How, um, do you think it's possible that we could terraform Mars or begin in my lifetime? Well, uh, maybe Jim can weigh in on this too. Uh, Growing plants inside a controlled environment is one thing, and that has its challenges, but that's a lot easier if you have a controlled environment, if you have the water and the light and the nutrients. Terraforming now on the outside Martian environment where it's very extreme in terms of temperature and changes, the low atmospheric pressure, the high UV radiation, that's much more challenging, and so you'd probably, uh, maybe a, a logical sequence is maybe you'd try to do something to alter the Martian atmosphere somehow, to make it more amicable and, and uh, uh, appealing to starting growing uh, things. And then once, if that could take place, then maybe, maybe the environment would be, you know, uh, supportive of, of trying to terraform. Jim, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, so what will happen um, is uh, scientists will resist the idea of terraforming. We want to know everything about the current state of the planet that we possibly can. Uh, we, we'd rather not modify it in any way. But I will tell you this, nature will modify it. The average temperature of Mars will continue to increase. And if it increases up to about seven degrees, that's enough then to start melting the CO2 polar cap. Now underneath that CO2 polar cap is water ice. But when you melt the CO2 polar cap, that will heighten uh, the pressure, and that will give you more of a greenhouse effect that will then also increase the temperature of the planet. Then the, sea, then the water ice on the northern polar cap will melt, and a significant part of that lost ocean will come back. And Mars will look more like Earth at that era than, than it has in three billion years. So when we look at our planets, we're really looking at them in a snapshot in time. And they're all going through a whole series of evolutions. And that's what we want to understand as scientists. So Jim, I, I've got my reasons, but it's a question that hasn't been asked. I mean, we all want to, but why, why should we go to Mars? Oh. As I said, we're explorers. This is a huge step for us. I see several with phones and computers in particular. I'm sure you always back up your computers. We actually need a place to back up the human race. And I'm serious about this. You know, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program. We know an enormous amount about our environment, okay? And the environment that we're in in the solar system. There are indeed near-Earth objects that are very large that are going to impact the Earth. It's not a matter of it, if, it's a matter of when. In the last five billion years, there's been five mass extinctions. If the human race is going to survive on this planet, we actually have to move. Now, that doesn't mean we're all going to go, but we have to be able to back up our human race. That's also part of our makeup. That's what makes us uniquely human. You can't stop it, even if you wanted to. All right, let's go to one of our questions from the DLN. My name is Peyton Smith, and I go to Deer Creek Intermediate, Intermediate in Wisconsin. My question is, how long has Mars been studied? Good question. So this year, it was um, August of this year, marked our 50th anniversary of studying Mars. And our first mission to Mars flew by it. And when that happened, the scientists you'd think would be really joyful, and in reality they weren't, because the area that we saw mostly was cratered, and we thought Mars looked more like the moon. 
And it actually set back Mars exploration for many years after that. After our flybys, we decided we needed orbiters. And so in 1969, 1970, we started with our orbiters. And then we began to realize how complex Mars really is. It has clouds. It has snow. It snows on Mars. The, the seasons are there. The vistas are unbelievable. It's got huge canyons that if, that, uh, if the Valles Marineris would be in the, in the United States, it would link the Atlantic and the Pacific together. It's got shield volcanoes bigger than the state of Missouri. I mean, it's an unbelievably beautiful planet in many different ways and really changed our opinion of it. And now, the more we know about the resources of the, that are there, the more we recognize that this terrestrial planet is most like Earth and the one that we can go to. And I believe there's a person or number of people that are alive today that will be the first people on Mars. Maybe somebody in this room? I hope so. I'd like to meet you. <laughs> All right, let's take a question from in the room. Do you still have a question? Somebody raised their hand earlier. All right, let's go right here. Uh, why is the government oh. interest in space exploration seem to be decreasing lately? In about 10 years during Cold War, we went from low Earth orbit with the Mercury program to the moon with the Apollo missions. Uh, and since then, we only send humans to low Earth orbit again. Uh, do you feel we need competition rivalry for science to, to develop? Well, first off, uh, it was absolutely amazing what we did uh, during the Apollo program. When you consider that Alan Shepard flew the first flight, first American human to fly in space in May of 1961, and he did a, a parabolic arc up into space, floated for about 15 minutes, and came down on the Atlantic Ocean. And a little over eight years later, we were walking on the moon. You also have to realize that at that time, we had 4.5% of the federal budget. We have a less than half of 1% now. So uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, given the resources, I think that we're doing an outstanding job. So we went transitioned from the Apollo program uh, we did Skylab, our first space station. We did the Apollo-Soyuz test project with the Russians. And we transitioned to shuttle. And shuttle would have flown sooner, but it got delayed. But in April, April 12, 1981, we flew the first shuttle mission. And for 30 years, we had the you know, most awesome you know, shuttle program. It was fantastic what we accomplished, all the science missions, the Hubble Space Telescope, building the International Space Station. And now, with the International Space Station, you know, we know how to get back and forth to low Earth orbit. It's time to transition low Earth orbit operations over to the commercial sector so NASA can focus on the really hard job of exploring beyond our home planet. So I think the course that we've laid out is it's a very good one, and we're going to make it happen. Great. All right. Um, do we have a quick question from social media? Okay. Th this question comes from L M MLE Jaster on Twitter. How are we protecting Mars' as environment as we explore the surface? So I think this would be to Jim Green. So when we launch spacecraft and we study what uh, we, we, we uh, know what their requirements are. We also study how that spacecraft might affect the environment they're going to. And we call that planetary protection. So we actually have in NASA a planetary protection officer. We interact with um, uh, Cassie Connolly, that planetary protection officer, and, and she helps us through making the decisions on what we need to do to be able to protect the environment we're going to. Give you an example. Uh, we have a spacecraft right now orbiting Saturn. It's called Cassini. Saturn has fabulous moons, one of which, Titan, has an atmosphere that's like, not like ours in the sense that it's mostly nitrogen. It's a wonderful world. It's got liquid on its surface, and we would not want to contaminate it by having Cassini crash on Titan. And so we're going to ditch Cassini into Saturn, and we're going to start that process about September of next year. And it will take us a year to get in a, in a position before we then can ditch it. But these are the things that we have to consider when we launch our spacecraft. All right. So um, 
would you all join me in thanking our panel for their, their time? In just a minute, we are going to hear from William Lewis, who is one of our interns here at Kennedy Space Center. That's right. You can get involved with NASA right now. We have citizen science projects. We have student challenges. We have uh, great prizes and challenges that are meant just for students, like our Future Engineers Challenge. And we have opportunities at each of our NASA centers for students to become interns. So before we hear from William, um, I just want to remind everyone that you can continue to send us questions with the hashtag AskNASA. And if you'd like more information about what our panelists talked about uh, or learn more about what NASA is doing on the journey to Mars, visit www.nasa.gov slash real Martians. And uh, you can learn more about NASA's real Martians, like one we're going to see right now. I'm Jennifer Stern. Join me as we journey to Mars. I work on an instrument called the Sample Analysis at Mars Instrument Suite on the Curiosity rover. And what that does is it measures the chemical composition of the surface and the atmosphere of Mars. My particular interest is nitrogen compounds. One really cool thing that we found is nitrate. It's a biologically and chemically available source of nitrogen. It's used by biology to make biomolecules such as amino acids and nucleobases. So working on sample analysis at Mars and the Curiosity rover is awesome because we're making these complex chemical measurements on the surface of another planet. These are measurements that are difficult sometimes to even make in your own laboratory, and yet we are doing it on the surface of Mars and getting data. All right, how's everybody doing today? Thank you for that wonderful introduction. My name is William Lewis. I am indeed an intern for Kennedy Space Center, the best place to work in the nation. I am an Aussie. Thank you. Give it up for Kennedy Space Center. I am an Aussie NIFS intern. And what Aussie stands for is One Stop Shopping Initiative. That's right, folks. NASA has designed a wonderful way to allow all of its next scientists, engineers, and astronauts to apply for NASA as soon as they graduate from high school. All you have to do is log on to intern.nasa.gov, create a simple profile, upload all the necessary information such as your enrolled university of choice, all your resumes, transcripts, all the things that make you awesome. Select the space center that you want to be an intern for and wait. Optional step, you can read and then reread The Martian until you know it front and back. <laughs> all right. Now I'm going to give you guys a little bit more information on how you can be an intern. Uh, there are a few ways to do it. I'm I can give you guys the obvious way, and I can give you guys the unspoken way. By a show of hands in the audience, who wants to hear the unspoken way? Unspoken way it is. All right, just a few pro tips. Uh, pro tip number one, don't let your dreams be dreams. Dreams are the first thing we own in this world. They're the most valuable thing to us. Nobody can take this away from you. And even when everyone else is telling you no, even when everyone else is telling you you can't do it, your dreams stay the same. Your dreams stay as you see fit. So hold on to them. Take care of them. Pro tip number two, be the best you can be. Make the best of any situation that you have, and all your dreams will come true. You won't always be in the best situation, I'm going to be honest. I've been in situations where I thought to myself, this is impossible. I don't have enough resources. I need more time. But hey, as Mr. Cabana said, they need astronauts that can perform in the most critical situations. Not every moment, is good, not every moment will, be, will be ideal, but it's up to you to make the best of it. And that's how you know you will be the best you can be and you can realize all of your dreams. And final pro tip, just have fun. Enjoy the journey. Life is a journey. Take advantage of all the moments to make the best of everything. Now, just keep in mind that no matter what comes your way, no matter what obstacles you have to face, you can overcome them. You are awesome. So I want everybody in the audience and everybody at home to look to their neighbor and say, neighbor. That's it. Act like you like each other. Say, neighbor. You be you, and I'll be me.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, that's all I have. That's all I have for today. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from the incredible director of The Martian, just to hear a little bit about what they had to go through to design this incredible and impactful movie. Our mysterious red neighbor Mars is like that. Could we live there? What secrets does it hold? How soon might humans be able to go there? These are questions that have fascinated me as a filmmaker and that NASA helped me to answer for my upcoming film, The Martian. Sending humans to Mars safely is a priority in NASA. It started with the landing of robotic rovers on Martian soil, such as Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity. The data and images of these magnificent robots have sent back to Earth have piqued our imagination and heightened our determination to go, paving the way for the safe journey and touchdown by humans in the 2030s. Humans are already preparing for this journey by living 250 miles overhead on the International Space Station where there is no gravity. The round trip to Mars could take 500 days or longer. The journey requires the most sophisticated technology ever built, including the new Orion spacecraft and the powerful space launch system rocket. When we invent new technologies for space exploration, it benefits all of humanity, contributing to new breakthroughs in medicine, communications, and manufacturing. The journey to Mars will change our history books forever, rewriting what we know about the Red Planet, expanding humans deeper into the solar system. Follow NASA's journey to Mars at nasa.gov. All right, we have a whole new set of experts here with us to talk about uh, the Martian and what NASA is doing on Mars right now and how we're getting ready for future exploration. So with us, we have Dave Lavery, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Nicole Stott, Joy Massa, and Michael Johansson. And uh, again, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, tell them a little, uh, tell you guys a little bit more about what they're working on right now, and so, I'm going to start off with Dave here. If you could land, I'm going to ask you a question. If you could land on one place on Mars, where would that be and why? If I could pick just one place, um, I actually would go back to the Mars Pathfinder landing site um, and for a couple of different reasons. Um, it, actually, one of the, the roles I had in working with the film is I was one of the NASA consultants on the group. Um, and one of the things that I, that I contributed was a lot of knowledge about Mars Pathfinder as the, the filmmakers were trying to actually display what that rover was like, what that spacecraft was like. I was able to pull out actually a lot of drawings and photographs because Mars Pathfinder was the first Mars mission that I ever worked on in my NASA career. And so I have a, a, a lot of connection with that one. I'd like to go back and find out um, whatever happened to our rover. Um, one of the things that is touched on very quickly in the book but uh, you don't really get too much out of it in, in the movie, is the fact that if you really ask us carefully, we actually don't know where is precisely where the rover is. Um, the way Mars Pathfinder worked is we communicated through the lander to the rover. The lander died first. We lost the communication pathway. The rover was then programmed, if it lost communication with Earth, to have a couple of behaviors that allowed it to continue to operate. We don't know how long it lasted or where it ended up when it finally gave out. I would like to go back to the Mars Pathfinder site and find my rover someday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Chiwetel, in the movie you play Vincent Kapoor, who has a very pivotal role. Can you tell us a little bit about how you prepped for that? How did you get ready to play a NASA official? Uh, well, it was there was a few different things and a few different approaches to it. You know, the um, uh, the first thing was, of course, uh, a conversation with which, with Ridley, which uh, the first conversation we had was talking about the film in very uh, broad terms and talking about the character in very broad terms. And then it was uh, uh, the book and uh, and then the screenplay. And you know, uh, Wikipedia open all the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just trying to cross reference everything and uh, and learn as much as I could about it. You know, it was a a completely new world for me and um, you know literally and I was very excited in that process and then I got a chance I mean we shot the film actually in in Budapest uh, so I got a chance to speak to people from 
uh, mainly from the European Space Agency. And uh, at that time, they were just um, they were just landing on the comet that they uh, successfully landed on. So I got a kind of first-hand look at just the uh, the excitement, the I, you know, the, the sort of the project leadership that was happening there, and uh, and um, and obviously the stress, you know, and the complications of uh, of the of the kind of work. And so it was. Um, it was a combination of those things that kind of allowed me to get an insight into into the sort of um, you know the kind of mindset of uh, of the of the agency, and uh, so that was a very exciting part of uh, of learning about it all. Fantastic, thank you, Nicole. I'm actually going to ask you the same question as I asked Dave, but from a totally different perspective. As an astronaut, if you could land one place on Mars, where would it be? Wow, I think I would want to land wherever Dave or Dr. Green tell me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> and you know, quite honestly, as astronauts, we're kind of the implementers of the, the experts, the scientists, our, our manager's um, mission. Uh, and you know, and that's a really wonderful thing to not have to, you know, have to be that expert as well. And NASA does a really good job of training us for uh, you know, what we need to know about the science or the systems or where we're going and that kind of thing. And I think the way they do that then allows us, like what's shown in this movie, to improvise if we need to, to um, react in almost a predictable way as a crew to you know, kind of rally in a calm, directed way to uh, address problems that come up. And you can pretty much guarantee that probably no day or activity will go exactly as it was planned. And even on the space station, although we have pretty much continuous ability to communicate now, there are times where we just don't have come with the control center or the um, issue that's happening takes that calm away from us. So. You still have to kind of be on your toes or float on your toes, I guess, to and, and be able to think quickly and work as a crew in, in a way that you would expect each other to respond. And I love in this movie how, um, I mean, the I won't spoil anything, but the excitement kind of kicks off with the crew doing exactly that. You know, it's hitting the fan and they respond in a very, um, I don't want to say emotionless way, but the kind of way you would need to deal with each other and to be successful. So yeah, I'll go where Dave and Dr. Green tell me. <laughs> All right, Joya, uh, tell us a little bit more about growing food in space. Sure. Um, I think it's very important, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit of a story on, as to why. Um, so imagine that you're on the longest plane ride or car ride that you've ever been on and it gets really boring and you're in this cramped space and you can't go outside and you're eating food that's, you know, maybe not home cooked would be the way to put it. And imagine that a hundredfold, okay? Not just one day of a really long trip, but a hundred days or longer. And then when you get there, you're on this, this place that's extreme and dangerous and alien and kind of scary and beautiful and exciting, but it's not home, okay? And the, 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 trip, the trip back is gonna be maybe the same length as the trip out, but it'll probably feel even longer. So think of the things that you'd miss, you know, the, the sights and the smells. You'll miss your family and friends, obviously. The tastes of home. Imagine that whole scenario if you had a garden, and think about what that garden might mean to you for this trip, something to anticipate, to mark changes in the passage of time, something to care for, and something to, to really get excited about, you know, that first salad that you're able to harvest that you grew yourself, that, that, that wonderful flavor and texture of a strawberry that you grew. So I think that that's really critical, and a lot of other people do too. And so that's why you know I'm working to help enable gardens for Mars. Excellent. Michael, you're researching dust mitigation technology, which sounds kind of awesome. Um, we learned from Andy Weir earlier, he uh, admitted that the, the Martian dust storm was a little bit of dramatic license. Wouldn't have happened exactly like that. Maybe we can get Dave to talk about that more later, but um, Dust is a problem for humans on Mars, so tell us a little bit about how you're working on that. 
Sure. So I assume that the creative license that you're talking about is the at the very beginning of the movie. There's this dust storm, and and it causes it sets off the whole story of the Martian. Um, the thing that we have to remember is that the Mars atmosphere is actually very thin. It's about one one hundredth of the atmosphere that we have here on Earth. And so as a result, even though we might have very high velocity wind, the force that we experience might not be much more than what we would experience here as a breeze on Earth. But it doesn't mean that dust storms aren't an issue. And dust storms are an issue because we have dust in dust storms. And if you look at any of our exploration missions, whether it be Apollo or the, uh, the more recent missions to Mars, what you'll see is that dust has always played a role in the design and the implementation of the vehicles. If you look at the Apollo missions, you'll notice that their spacesuits are completely covered in dust. And they weren't really used that much. And when you compare that to the amount of time that we'll use them for future exploration missions, there's, there's some things that we need to work out. If you look at the uh, Mars exploration rovers, you'll notice that their solar panels are covered with dust. If you look at the Curiosity rover, you'll notice that what used to be pristine white is now a rustish color. And so NASA's currently developing technologies that will eliminate or at least significantly limit the effects of dust on the Martian surface, whether that be uh, actually on surfaces or even through uh, in situ resource utilization plants. So also the Mars atmosphere is very dusty and we have ways to remove dust from the atmosphere before we send them into the, the chemical processing plants that you heard about in the previous talk. So the bottom line is, yeah, dust is an issue and we're working on a way to solve that problem. Great. All right, um, we have our students, our DLN students online again. So let's go to one of our questions on the DLN. Hi, this is Lauren Flanagan. The eighth grade students from Douglas Middle School in Douglas, Massachusetts want to know what technology or advancements are necessary for humans to live on Mars? That's a great question. Uh, who would like to start with that? Um, I'll take an initial whack at it. Uh, the real answer to your question is all of them. Um, right now, we have uh, a basic idea of what technologies, we have experience with what technologies it takes to get rovers and robotic systems to Mars, and we're actually at, at the point where we're getting kind of good at that, fortunately. But the, the leap that it takes in terms of technology development and engineering to move from robotic systems where we may be landing on the order of one metric ton at a time down onto the surface to human systems getting to the surface of Mars where we're all, all of a sudden we're landing more than an order of magnitude more, perhaps even close to two uh, orders of magnitude more mass on the surface. And so none of the systems that we have right now to get that much mass to Mars, get it down to the surface safely. Um, they don't exist right now. We're working on them, we're developing them, but we've not been able to actually use them yet and we're continuing to develop that system. Likewise, the, the systems that a human would need to actually survive on the surface, life support, is something that we haven't yet developed. That's under, uh, under creation right now. But perhaps most important to anyone who would actually be on that crew the systems for returning from Mars, actually blasting off from the surface, getting up to Mars orbit, and then getting from Mars orbit back to Earth orbit, have th those systems have not yet been developed and tested and validated. So all of those, along with many, many other uh, subordinate technologies, radiation protection, um, uh, nutrition uh, analysis, and, and tools for uh, maintaining crew health and spacecraft health, all of those sort of things are all in development right now, and, and we need all of them. And basically, we need a whole bunch of really good, really smart people who understand how to tackle these problems. And this is why I'm looking at all the students that are in the room right now, um, as well as all the ones that are out there. You know, I said that I would love to go to Mars and find my Pathfinder rover someday. Well, that's not going to happen without a whole bunch of people making that sort of journey possible, and that's where we need all of you guys. How significant, then, is the, uh, the, water, is the water issue, then? now and then discovery of water. So the, the water issue is a really a, a fascinating question um, because we've known for a long time that there was water on Mars. It's, it's in the, uh, frozen up in, the, in the, the polar caps of the planet. We actually can see the polar caps expanding and receding with the seasons and we knew that it was part 
uh, water ice and part frozen carbon dioxide. The thing that's been a real surprise recently, um, and not just with Monday's announcement, but even just going back the past few years, is finding out how extensive the potential reservoirs of water may be on Mars today. Uh, we, we've had measurements and observations from various different uh, Mars orbiters, and primarily the Mars Express spacecraft from the European Space Agency, that have given us indications of large reservoirs of frozen water subsurface, relatively near the surface, a few meters down, um, volumes of water that were perhaps several times the volume of the Great Lakes. And that was very exciting. But that was sort of a, what we thought might be a frozen matrix of mu basically mud. Um, but what we just announced on Monday is not just the possibility of frozen water subsurface, but active liquid water at and near the surface of Mars that is basically very accessible. So as soon as you get to that point, the idea of water being accessible at the surface and, and being able to be utilized by a human crew uh, becomes a, a game changer in terms of how we would get to Mars. We no longer have to worry about taking all the water we need to survive with us. Instead, we can basically farm water that's there, process it, use it obviously for drinking water for the people, but you can also use it and, and, and crack it and break it down to, to provide the uh, oxygen to breathe, but also then combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and other forms to create the rocket fuel you're going to need for a return trip. So it really changes a whole scenario or the whole ar architecture for how we get to Mars and get people back. So that, that's a, a very big deal. Don't forget watering your plants, too. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Lots of potatoes. To uh, Dr. Green talked it about a little bit the just the nutrients and the components of the soil that we're finding now that can benefit what you want to do as well. Yeah, this whole area of in situ resource utilization (ISRU) that we keep talking about. I mean, the more that we can use on Mars, the less we have to take with us. You know, and that's one of the other benefits of potentially growing plants. Seeds are a lot lighter to take than food. So if you can recycle things, recycle um, the, the, the inedible plant wastes, the human wastes, all of these things are no longer wastes. They're resources. And if we have resources available on Mars as well, then we're, you know, we're, we're, we're farther along than we would be if we had to take everything with us. So um, using any of those resources is going to be really, really valuable because it costs a lot to launch even you know, a small amount of material to Mars. All right, uh, let's take a question from one of our students here in the room. that question, it was about astronauts. Do astronauts do mental training and other kind of preparation to be away from home for so long? Nicole? Okay. Um, yes, we do. In fact, part of the selection process involves that as well. Some psychological exams that you take, both written and uh, interviews that, that go on. So they're, they're looking at that uh, in the whole selection process. Um, how they really psych that out, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but it seems to work. And then uh, it's interesting. I would say the bulk of our training outside of you know, learning about the systems and the, the scientific aspects of the payloads and, and research that are going on is really team building what we call expeditionary type training. And that can be everything from going and living for a couple weeks underwater in a habitat that's similar to what you would experience in space. Uh, on a space station or on the surface of a planet somewhere, to um, hiking in the canyon lands of Utah for 10 days with just the six people in your crew and not seeing anybody for that entire time. And a big part of that is you learn how you work together as a crew, but you also learn a lot about yourself, this, this kind of self-awareness that I think you really have to have uh, in order to understand what your own strengths and weaknesses are, what those of your crew are, so that you can work best as a team. And then when you're on your own, I, you know, I can tell you, when you're out on a spacewalk and you know, you're in your own little spaceship 
crawling around the space station, you, ha you have to understand those kinds of things about yourself and how you're going to deal with something if things don't go as planned. And I think we do a really good job of incorporate, kind of subtly even incorporating that into the bulk of our training. And I know now there's a lot of studies going on where we're polling ourselves with um, questions from our behavioral science folks on, you know, if you were on this kind of class of mission going this long, this far, uh, based on your experience on the space station or on the space shuttle, what do you think you know, you would need those kinds of things like, you know, growing fresh food, fresh, you know, having plants around you, visual references that you lose if you go farther from Earth, you know, those kinds of things. How do you supplement it? How do you communicate with your family and friends? And it's, it's a big deal. And it's really neat to see kind of the evolution of how we develop plans for incorporating those things into a mission. Okay, let's go to one of our questions from the DLN. Hi, on behalf of the students at Atlantic Technical High School, we want to know what do we hope to gain from our explorations to Mars? It's also our <laughs> what, what do we hope to gain from our exploration to Mars? I think probably the, the thing that we hope to gain the most is the thing that we don't know how to ask about, if that makes any sense. It's the stuff that we don't know is there that is probably going to be the most amazing, the most valuable, the most interesting that we're going to find out about Mars. Um, Jim Green talked earlier about the idea that having Mars as the beginning of Earth 2.0 as an, our ability to back up the species is, is a huge thing. But in addition to that, we're going to discover stuff when we get to Mars, um, things that the robotic systems may not have been able to tell us yet uh, that are going to surprise us and we'll sort of sit there and go, how did we not see this coming? But of course, those are all the great, wonderful discoveries. and so. Um, I think those are the ones that will be most valuable, most interesting to us. Yeah, and I think we can't discount all of the things that we'll discover along the way as we as we learn to live to get to Mars. I mean, you know, a lot of the things that we've developed now to learn to live in low Earth orbit have had a lot of Earth-based benefits as well. And, you know, I think that's just going to be um, accelerated as we proceed towards Mars. Um, so all of these things will impact everyone on Earth. And to, to talk uh, to Dr. Green's point earlier about, you know, backup planet for humanity, you can also think of it as a backup planet for all life on Earth. You know, we're, we're, we're the only species on this planet that's spacefaring at the moment. But, you know, life on Earth has evolved and is complex and is, is wonderful. And so we're kind of everybody else's only hope as well, all the animals and plants and everything. So think of it that way as well. It's pretty important stuff. I, I will modify that just one little bit and just point out that <laughs> right now, to the best of our knowledge, Mars is currently the only planet in the universe populated solely by robots. <laughs> That's kind of cool. All right, we have another DLN question. So let's go to our question on the DLN. Hi, we're from Grimsley High School in North Carolina. And our question is, I read that um, on the trip to Mars, the spaceship would be subjected to lots of radiation, which is a lot more than normal. And we're wondering, how would you combat that? Radiation. Who wants to? That sounds like something a lot of it, the, the crew would have high interest in. Um, so what, one of the things that we are working on now in the, uh, the various Mars and spacecraft technology programs is radiation protection systems. Um, OK, throw a couple numbers at you. One of the things we've done in our analysis and um, using some of the uh, measurements from the Curiosity rover and other spacecraft is uh, been to look at the radiation levels that the spacecraft is exposed to both during the cruise from Earth to Mars as well as down on the Mars surface. And using those measurements, we've been able to determine that for what we estimate would be a typical 500-day mission from Earth to Mars, Mars surface, then back to Earth, you would get a total body or dose of, of just over 1.01 sieverts of radiation. Um, okay, and that's 
considerably higher than the typical level that you would get uh, as a human existing on, uh, on Earth under the protection of the Earth atmosphere and the Earth magnetosphere. What that translates into is an estimated uh, lifetime probability of about an increase of about 5% of contracting a fatal cancer. So that, that's a fairly significant increase in radiation dose that the astronauts would be exposed to. To counteract that, we are looking at a lot of different technologies for how to protect the, the humans, both during that transit from Earth to Mars and back to Earth, which actually is when most of it is absorbed, as well as down on the Mars surface itself. And there are all sorts of different shielding technologies that we're taking a look at, um, as well as ultimately in the long term and seeing if there might be things that we could do to the, to the astronauts themselves, to the human body, to be able to better contend with absorbed radiation for things that we can't shield from. We don't have the ultimate answer yet. We're working on it right now, but it very definitely is one of the, the topics of interest. All right, let's go to a question here in the room. We've got a question right here. How will we extract the water from polar ice caps? I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm an actor. <laughs> yeah, but in, in the movie, you knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We shot it a while ago. <laughs> I could have I told you then. The research was. I mean, b basically, what you're looking at is just sort of the ultimate instantiation of a big water for purification system. It, it's one of the things that, with the recent um, announcement on uh, on Monday, of actually having potentially liquid water at and near the surface all over the planet, not just the poles. One of the things that that does is tell us that it's much more accessible, which means we don't actually have to go to the poles just to get to these water resources, but we can actually tap into stuff that's near the surface in equatorial regions. But what you've got there and, and what we are you know, describing as water is basically a, a thick, extremely salty brine but you've then got to go through a process of purifying that. But there are all sorts of different processes you can use. But if it's uh, sort of a frozen mud, first thing you do is you melt it, you get the liquid. From that, you can then distill it to purify it, um, filtration processes, things like this. So, so those techniques are actually pretty well understood for being able to extract the water. Or if you really wanted to get sort of sporty about things, again, if you watch the movie or if you read the book, there is a fairly dramatic uh, chemical process that can take place if you're willing to insert enough energy and control how it's extracted uh, to convert um, oxygen and, and uh, hydrazine into, into drinkable water. Um, it's not a recommended practice, but it does work. All right, let's go to a question from social media. So hi, this is a question, so I have, I have two, one's very quick for Nicole. Um, this is from Emily Martinez, although several other people want to know, do NASA astronauts really bring duct tape to space? Yes. <laughs> Do you have any fun uses they used for it? Or? Yeah, there, I, it is uh, one of the staples up there for all kinds of things. And um, I think it's, it kind of speaks to this philosophy of you know, keeping it simple. Uh, I think there's a lot of places where we um, can think about very complex ways to do things, and the simplest way is usually the better way. And duct tape is one of those really brilliant examples of that. Yeah. Um, and this is from um, Dr. Holland, who is actually, he's one of our DLN. Um, it's from Lincoln Junior High. He's one of the teachers. Um, and this is to Chiwetel. What is, was the most difficult part about making the movie look realistic, at least on your end? I didn't think it was hard. You know, a lot of the work had been done before, you know, in terms of, uh, obviously, Andy Weir's, you know, brilliant book. Uh, uh, Drew Goddard's great script, and so um, you know, I think that what they were able to do is really combine these ideas of uh, of science fiction and science fact. So it almost felt seamless, you know. Um, like I was saying before, a lot of time I spent just with the Wikipedia page open and uh, and cross referencing things, and you know, really trying to understand what the what the science fiction parts were, you know, and then being able to look at the location, for example, of Pathfinder and uh, and its capabilities, and see what the differences were with the Pathfinder that we had and the one that's actually up there, you know, and it's um, so that was a very exciting just understanding the depth of research that has been taken already. Um, so I was very, I was, I was, I was sort of thrilled to come on board with something, especially with Ridley Scott, 
who has such an in-depth sort of understanding and uh, and uh, you know and and is able to combine that with this really sort of uh, extraordinary creative imagination. So um, so a lot of that was already prepared. So you could just kind of concentrate on 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 acting, which was which was great. You said a little bit earlier, well, I'm just an actor, I just, you know, kind of thing. But I would like to say that, you know, I've, I've been on, I think it's been two days now of this, this trip, um, going along with the movie and sharing both kind of the science side and the, the, the movie side of this whole thing. And I just want to say thank you because, you know, from Ridley Scott to Andy and the folks who put together the story, um, it has been really impressive to me to spend time with, you know, Sebastian the last two days and Mackenzie and now meeting you and to see the, I, I mean, I think really the deep down heartfelt enthusiasm for what the, the basis of the story is and to allow us, and I say us as NASA, to communicate to audiences that might not ever think about space in their day to day you know, routine. And I think we need to do more of that. We need to do more, you know, presenting of the real kind, you know, the science fact stuff mixed with, you know, really interesting stories to engage the public and to help them recognize the, the wonderful things we're doing in space right now on the station with our robotic exploration and what we have to look forward to in, um, you know, this journey to Mars. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, believe it or not, we are almost out of time. So let's go to one last question uh, on the DLN. My question is, how is it possible for sandstorms to be on Mars with the low atmosphere? So there's still an atmosphere. It's just thin. So there, there's still wind that can that can uh, move around dust, and it's it's not something that we it's 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 enough of an atm what we say is it's enough of an atmosphere that we have to worry about, but not enough that we can do a whole lot with, um, besides the the chemical processing type thing. So uh, similar to how we can uh, kick up dust here on Earth, we can also kick up dust in the Martian atmosphere. How does the dust compare between Earth dust and Mars dust? So there, there are some differences. Uh, for, for one, um, I'm told by the medical team and also by some chemists that uh, it's a bit toxic, so you probably don't want to be around it, which is another one of the reasons why um, dust mitigation technology is so important. Um, in When we look at uh, other places, uh, so if we look at, for example, um, the moon, uh, they're, they're jagged particles uh, because we don't have an atmosphere to kick around the dust and smooth, smooth the particles. Um, and there, there's some of that on, on Mars as well. So there's different mechanics, there's different, different chemical makeup, and we're left to figure out what to do with it. How, to, how do we exploit it for our exploration purposes and keep away from the nasty part of it. Is the, is the wind helpful for uh, energy production? Maybe if it was, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe if it was uh, the right system, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty thin atmosphere. All right, uh, I just want to say thank you um, to our awesome panel up here, and thank you to all of our speakers today, and to all of you and all of our students uh, on the DLN and everyone who watched us on NASA TV uh, for participating and sending in your questions today. And I hope you'll continue to follow along with NASA, and remember you can learn more about NASA's work on the journey to Mars by visiting www.nasa.gov. Thanks, everyone. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's gonna go south on you. Ready? 
you're gonna say this is it. What the hell? This is how I end. Commander, Mark is dead. We have to go now. Yeah. Now you can either accept that, or you can get to work. This will come as quite a shock to my crewmates, and to NASA, and to the entire world. But I'm still alive. Surprise. Here's the rub. It's gonna be four years for another mission to reach me. And I'm gonna have designed the last 31 days. So I gotta make water and grow food on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, then none of this matters anyway. We've got an incoming message. My God. <laughs> Mark Watney's still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. There must be some kind of way out of here. Okay, so let's do the math. I have enough food to last for 50 days. He's going to starve to death long before we can help. So, I'm gonna have to science the out of this. He's 50 million miles away from home. He's totally alone. What the hell is he thinking right now? I am the greatest botanist on this planet. I know how to save Mark Watney. But we need the Hermes crew. We either have a high chance of killing one or a low chance of killing six. I'm not risking their lives. It's bigger than one person. No. It's not. NASA rejected the mission. So if we do this? We're talking mutiny. If anything goes wrong, we die. Do you realize how crazy this is? We have no other option. No matter what happens, tell the world, tell my family, that I never stop fighting to make it home. <laughs>